Hello, everybody. My name is Gabriel Chabron. Uh, I am the Priority Projects Manager with EXP. I'd like to welcome you to today's presentation as part of our virtual guest speaker series co-hosted with the Proven Ready program. Before I introduce today's speaker, I want to briefly tell you a little bit about our organizations. EXP is a local Southern California nonprofit known as the Opportunity Engine. Why is that? Through programs like this one, EXP prepares great students like you for a better life. Our programs help gain uh, experience, unlock doors, and build the confidence you need to succeed in school, career, and life. Proven Ready helps build tomorrow's workforce today by giving high school students the opportunity to learn more about college career opportunities in business entrepreneurship, global trade, and advanced transportation and logistics, and the opportunity to earn industry certified credentials in those sectors. Check out our websites, expfuture.org and provenready.org, or follow us on social media. Now let's get started by giving a warm welcome to today's speaker, Captain Kip Ludit from the Southern California Marine Exchange. A little bit about Captain Kip. Captain Kip was appointed the Executive Director of the Marine Exchange of Southern California in January 2013. A graduate of the United States Coast Guard Academy, he served in the United States Coast Guard for 30 years prior to retiring with the rank of captain. Captain Ludus' experiences include a 10, 10 years at sea in the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean and in the Bering and Mediterranean and Caribbean seas. Wow, very cool. He had six years in command, three different Coast Guard cutters, and two years commanding officer in the United States Coast Guard Integrated Support Command in San Pedro. Following retirement from the Coast Guard, Captain Ludit worked on two consulting firms on Coast Guard, with the Coast Guard and Pentagon work. Captain Ludit leads a staff of 20 civilians and a Coast Guard detail of six active duty operations specialists with an annual budget of 3.2 million. The Marine Exchange of Southern California is a nonprofit organization first established in 1923, and it is a unique among the nation's vessel traffic services and having a private slash public partnership with the uh, Coast Guard. The Marine Exchange continuously works to promote a safe, secure, efficient, reliable, and environmentally sound maritime transportation system. And with that, uh, I'd like to turn it over to our friend and colleague, Captain Kip. Thank you so much for being here. It's funny when I read your bio, Captain Kip, I, I see the word retired and I don't think that that really applies to you because you always are doing something, but I guess that's just in relation to your, your service, the Coast Guard. But with that, uh, welcome Captain Kip. Thank you for being here today. Thank you, Gabriel. It's great to be here. So let me see if I can share my screen. It's great to be here today. And yes, in terms of the retired piece, that was basically first career. And now I'm really on third career. And I'll divert from the slides to say that continuous development of yourself and how you can reshape yourself at different points in life is very important. And the other thing I'd like to reassure you is both for my Coast Guard career and now this presentation about what the Marine Exchange does, you never have to go on a boat and get seasick. Um, and you can still participate very, very well in the maritime environment. And I look forward to chatting with you about that. So in terms of process, if you put uh, comments in the chat or questions, uh, Gabriel and Eva will ask them at the end and we'll hold questions till the end, but just because in this format that works uh, better. So is that all right, we'll get started? Sounds good. Take all right. Away. So here's our beautiful building on a hill down in San Pedro. In normal times, we often have the EXP classes down, either the internships or uh, job shares and sometimes a field trip. So hopefully when COVID is over, we can get back to that. And as Gabriel said, the bumper sticker throughout all of this is we facilitate safe, secure, efficient, reliable, and environmentally sound maritime transportation. So, I'd like to have an agenda with a presentation. So I'll talk a little bit about me, the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach that we serve, the Marine Exchange itself, and you can see it circled there on the picture, our maritime information service, our vessel traffic service, the COVID-19 situation. And if you've looked out and seen all the ships out there, we'll talk about those. 
and then a closing. So a little bit about me and thank you for the kind bio here. It puts a little bit more in perspective. I grew up in New York City, shared a room with my sister, sailed as a child with my family, and then spent four wonderful years at the US Coast Guard Academy. And if you've ever considered a service academy or just want to talk about what it's about, uh, please get a hold of me. I honestly would do it all over again. And the nice thing is for you and your parents, it's free, just like West Point, Annapolis, Air Force, all the other service academies. And I got to sail the Coast Guard's uh, big 295 foot square rigger Eagle uh, in Operation Sail 1976, which was fun for somebody from New York to actually go into New York for the bicentennial on that cool old ship. So then as Gabriel mentioned, 30 years in the Coast Guard and other passions. I'm in the Coast Guard Auxiliary, which are the volunteer part of the Coast Guard. I'm still a volunteer with the Boy Scouts. My wife and I run a high school robot team out of our garage. I love boating and sailing. And without exaggeration, I really do enjoy working with young people like you, EXP, Banning High School, and the others around that are part of that program. And it seems amazing that uh, we haven't been able to meet in person for over a year. So the pictures I picked is when we did the Earning the Right uh, program and wonderful back to school day in September of 2019. We had the students build Pinewood Derby cars, which are used by Cub Scouts, but to make it different and more challenging for the high school students, you had to have an egg on the car and the egg didn't break, or that was the goal. And actually it turned out every car, the egg did not break. Um, so it basically became a speed competition, but I look very much to getting back to that kind of thing with you. Marine Exchange goes back to 1923, and we don't have telescopes, blackboards, or megaphones anymore. We have state-of-the-market technology, which I'll talk about. But basically, the overall theme of what a port needs, the schedule of the ships, seeing when they're arriving, so tugboats and line handlers and all the other port services can be ready, and communicating with them. We no longer use megaphones yelling out the window. We've got all the modern conveniences but the overall concept is the same. So if you ever come down to the Marine Exchange, we're in a unique place, which is on top of a World War I gun emplacement. So to think that 100 years ago, San Pedro and Los Angeles were defended by soldiers with guns such as this. For World War II, the facility was used for Navy control of shipping. For the Cold War, it was the control site for Nike missiles, and that's not Nike of the shoe company, it's just the name of them. If you've ever seen Western Boulevard that goes between PV and San Pedro, right at the foot down on the water, the old missile silos are still there, and we were the control site. And today, we're the maritime transportation hub for the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach. So here's a look at what shipping in the Pacific looks like on a given day. And this is a sensor system that we have in partnership with the other marine exchanges on the West Coast in uh, Juneau, Alaska, Seattle, Portland, Oregon, San Francisco, and here. So every one of those little triangles is a merchant ship and the other colors, for example, are fishing boats and other kinds of things. So there's the big population of ships in the Pacific and 4,500 of them come here to Los Angeles and Long Beach. So individually, LA is the number one container port in the country measured by container count. Long Beach is number two and New York, New Jersey is number three. If you put LA and Long Beach together, it's the ninth busiest port complex in the world. The 2020 figures aren't out yet, but will fall somewhere right in that range. 17.3 million TEUs, and that's a 20 foot equivalent unit. And in English, that means basically the short trucks or the short trailers behind a truck. And I'll show you a picture in a moment. But 17.3 million of them came through the port complex. You could read the other numbers. That number always stays roughly the same. You can see the value of the cargo, but to think that half the cargo in the country comes in through this port complex. But it's not just about containers. We also have cruise ship passengers, oil, half a million cars and 4 million jobs uh, are supported nationwide by the commerce that comes through here. 
So you can see where I drew the line on the slide between the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach. And while they're independent operating units, they actually work together. So for example, the labor and the tugboats and all go back and forth between the two ports. And I put the star there, which is roughly where the marine exchanges were in Angels Gate Park, right next to the Korean Bell, if you've ever come down there. So here's one of the things that you need to know if you're going to work in the maritime industry, which is the language. And as I said, you never have to go on a boat or a ship, but you need to, for example, know what a TEU is. So back in the 1950s, they invented these containers. They're all the same size worldwide. So everybody can stack them and everybody on the picture on the right, you can see they've got two of the 20 foot equivalent units stacked under one 40 foot equivalent unit. And again, this makes it wonderfully easy to move these boxes around the world. And they fit on ships like this. If you've ever uh, seen one, you can see them all stacked up. And what blows my mind, if you look across the back of the ship, to think that each one of those is a truck and to think that's a, like a 13 lane highway moving down the road. So these ships are amazingly efficient and you can read all the different brands of the containers on the ship. So you see Evergreen and China Shipping and Lloyd's. And what's amazing is the computer folks have figured out how to track all these containers as much as 23,000 TEUs on one single ship these days. So they get to where they're going so the bananas don't go to Home Depot and the plywood doesn't go to the supermarket, for example. The other major types of ships that come in here are car carriers. And just like it says, they drive the cars on when they're the imports that come from overseas, then they drive them back off. Cruise ships are another big population who come in here. And I also highlighted something that's special, and it's another term of art we use, which is bunkering. So you take your car to the gas station to get fuel, in the case of ships, they bring the fuel to the ship in a barge and it's called bunkering, not refueling. And then the last picture down on the bottom is a tanker. You can see they're long and low. When the oil is pumped out, the tanker rides higher in the water and they carry crude oil to be refined, gasoline, jet fuel, and the variety of chemicals that are needed for manufacturing. So if you lay all those different ships out on a pie graph, and here your math teacher should be happy. Basically, you can read the bottom in terms of the numbers, but I'll just highlight what's in the circle. So containers, as I mentioned, are the number one type of commodity that comes in here, and 47% of the ships are container ships. Number two, you can see up on the low, upper left-hand side are the tankers, 13% of the ships, and I can put there where it's down 2% from the year before. But notice number three, 13% of the ships come in just to refuel. So Long Beach is where they do it. LA doesn't do it on their side, but 13% of the ships just come here to anchor, have that barge come alongside, refuel, and then go on their way because this port complex has made that commercial venture so efficient. Number four are the bulk ships. And that's just what it says is it's a cargo that is coming in loose and in bulk. So for example, gypsum to make wallboard, uh, salt for your salt shaker, exporting scrap metal, exporting coal, all the stuff that's just loose in a ship. Number five are barges and articulated uh, tugs and barges. We get lumber, for example, down from the Pacific Northwest. We get various refined products come down from a big refinery in San Francisco that kind of thing comes in a tug and a barge. Number six are vehicle ships. Like I showed you the picture are 4% of the traffic. Other is stuff like uh, ships bringing in cranes, um, school ships, training ships, that kind of thing. For example, California has the Golden Bear, the training ship for California Maritime. That's what fits in other. And then passenger ships are for 2020, only 2% of the traffic. It should be about 10, but basically COVID, I don't know if you read in the news, shut down all cruising because of the social distance issue. So only 2% of the ships came in last year for cruise ships, whereas normally it would be nine or 10. So here looks back in time and to put what COVID did to the shipping industry in perspective. And I know it's a busy slide, 
but it makes a couple points by doing it that way. So if you look all the way on the left-hand side, that's the year 2000. And each one of those individual lines is January, February, March, April, May for that particular year. But if you just look broadly, roughly 500 ships per month came in in the year 2000. And you can see it ranged from about you know, 475 up to 525, let's say roughly 500. And then look at today where we're down at 380. So it's interesting that 120 fewer ships per month come in here. Why did that happen? Well, in part, it was the recession of 2010. But the second thing that's happened is the ships have gotten bigger. So when I was here on active duty, an 8,000 TEU ship, 8,000 of those 20 foot equivalent units was a big ship. And these days we routinely get 16,000 TEU ships. And as I mentioned before, we've had 23,000 TEU ships. So what's interesting is while ship count has gone down, cargo volume has gone up. But if you look at the very right hand side of the slide, you can see that January and February and March started out pretty well, but then May and June were the lowest two months of ship count in the modern history of the Marine Exchange, which goes back to the year actually 1980. We had the lowest ship counts in the past 40 years. And that was very devastating to many industries such as mine, tugboats, pilots, line handlers, and longshoremen for a time because they depend on those ships coming in with that cargo. The cargo then came back late in the fall with respect to containers, and I'll talk about that more later. But for example, anyone still associated with the cruise industry, the hotels, the shuttle buses, the entertainment, the restaurants that want those passengers coming and going, they are still really, really hurting. So we've had lower ship count because of COVID and post 9-11 attacks, the recession, and then congestion of five years ago. So now moving on inside the Marine Exchange itself, there are, as I mentioned, two pieces to the business. One is the Maritime Information Service, which goes back to 1923. And they gather and collate the schedules for the roughly 4,500 ships that come into the port, depart the port and move around between the two ports as they do their business. So there's Patty and their shell, and they've got three other colleagues. And as I mentioned before, in terms of the proven ready, program that you're in, neither Patty or Michelle or any of the other three have ever been to sea, but basically they like working in the maritime industry in this scheduling function that they do. And the skill set to do this function has nothing to do with knowing how to steer a ship or what a compass is, but it's basic telephone skills, it's being on time, it's great precision. So if the agent on the phone says the ship will dock at 6 p.m., they better not put down 6 a.m. Or if the agent says it's going to berth 186, they'd better not mistype it to 168, where the tugs and the pilots and the line handlers and everybody are going to be confused and going to the wrong place. And I'm really, really proud of the work they do. The Vessel Traffic Service started in 1994 when there was enough traffic to need to control it. It's a unique public private partnership, as Gabriel mentioned, where I'm a civilian paid by a user fee that the ship pays. And then you can see Patty Sir Thomas there is active duty Coast Guard. So we've got a blended workforce here, which really, really gives great service to the ships and to the ports. We're the, basically the maritime version of air traffic control. So when the ship checks in with us 25 miles from the port, we verify where it's going, when it's supposed to be there. And if it's early and their berth isn't available, and that's the situation that we have now, as many as 60 ships we've had waiting for their berth, we give them a proper berth or anchorage, which in a sense is a parking place in the ocean, and they wait until it's time for them to come in. And roughly 28,000 movements per year are what Petty Officer Thomas and his colleagues control. So we're just one of 12 vessel traffic services around the country. You can see the map there with the stars. And on this coast, there's one up in Valdez, there's one in Puget Sound, there's one in San Francisco, and then the one here. If you wonder why there's one in Louisville, Kentucky, in the middle of the country, if you hear on the news when there are floods on the Mississippi River, in the springtime when the snow melts, they set up a vessel traffic service there to help coordinate the tug and barge traffic 
and you can look at where the other ones are in the Gulf Coast and on the East Coast. But basically you put a vessel traffic service somewhere where it's a busy waterway, it's a confined waterway to make sure there are no collisions and no groundings. And as you can read on the slide, we have a perfect record of zero collisions, two ships hitting each other or grounding, the ship running into the bottom of the ocean of underway vessels in the 27 years we've been in business. And we're very, very proud of that. So here's what that vessel traffic service watch floor looks like at any given time, 24 hours a day. So while you're sleeping at midnight tonight or two in the morning, three of my people are here. So in this case, it's John and Chi and Pastor Thomas. And they basically stand two hours on the phone watch, which is where John is sitting down, two hours on the radar, and then two hours on a break to be available if they're needed. Looking at the radar can be really, really hard on your eyes. You really need to be on your game, which is why they have that break. So in the vessel traffic service itself, there are 11 members who are members of the 501c6 nonprofit firm that we are, and then the six Coast Guard members. So each watch has two marine exchange controllers funded by the user fee and one Coast Guard controller funded by you, the taxpayer. But it's that Coast Guard controller who has what's called captain of the port authority, which is direct the ship traffic. And that's a federal function that flows down through Petty Officer Thomas and his other colleagues to us. And this is what Paris and Thomas is looking at. The top left-hand screen is actually security cameras and cameras that look over the port so we can see what's going on at long range. The lower left-hand uh, slide is a big picture view. You can see Catalina Island and looking all the way up to the north end of Santa Monica Bay. The picture on the right-hand side of that screen is in close to the port. I'll show you more later. There's a status board up on top in the middle. The computer in the middle on the bottom is the schedule of the ships coming in so they know what to expect. There's another security camera looking at the port up on top. And then the bottom right-hand screen is looking all the way up from Morro Bay down to Manzanillo, Mexico. And that's the piece of water that we look at and then control the ships when they get in close. And if you're some kind of a techie, this would be a job for you. We've got software development that goes on here because every port tends to be different and therefore we need a custom software product to uh, run that. But on the bigger picture, we're using AT&T, we're using Microsoft, all the normal kind of products that you would use. Basically, if you can run PowerPoint, you can actually do the mouse clicking part of being a vessel traffic controller. When actually you turn the radar on these days, in the old days, you'd get kind of like a television tube look. Now it looks just like the flat screen TV at home with Windows 10. It's amazing. So if you like that kind of world, this could be the place for you. The other thing, if you like networking, we have nine radar sites that feed the system. We've got nine integrated AIS sites. That's a receiver of a signal that the ship puts out between Morro Bay and San Diego. And all the networking and firewalls and IP and all that kind of stuff, we've got people who handle that to keep the electrons flowing so Petter Sir Thomas and his colleagues can do their work. And yet down at the bottom, you can see with an optical camera and a huge pair of binoculars, because sometimes looking out the window is the best way to see the ships. So basically, the largest port complex in the country has a state of the market system, and it works really, really beautifully. So here's another way of looking at what Pastor Thomas is looking at. There you can see Morro Bay to the Mexican border and out 100 miles. The middle picture is the 25 mile vessel traffic ring from Point Furman. That's the little lighthouse right down below where our building is on the point in uh, the south end of San Pedro. And then the precautionary area is on the right where all the ships enter the port and anchor. So another thing that is unique about this is if you spread the traffic out over a 24 hour period, there'd be a ship only like every half hour or so, but that's not what the commercial market wants to do. So this is a typical morning while you're getting out of bed or brushing your teeth, we have rush hour. And you can see up to the left-hand side of the screen where there's the green ships that are circled. Everyone, uh, as I mentioned, the ship 
has a transmitter that says, here I am, here I am, with the NYK Terra and the MOL Majesty, the little vector in front is where the ship will be in 15 minutes. They're all lined up because they want to come in and clear customs, open hatches, and be ready for working cargo when the longshoremen come to work at seven or eight o'clock in the morning. So this is a typical picture from like two to six o'clock in the morning. As I mentioned before, 28,000 vessel movements per year, the biggest ships in the world. And if you look at those yellow dots on the screen, those are radar targets that we're picking up, but we have no idea what it is. And that's why I circled them in red. And that's where we can just warn the ship. There are uncorrelated targets in the precautionary area, master beware, and the master will figure out how to avoid this plastic kayak or a speedboat or something that doesn't have AIS, but is picked up by our radar. And it may surprise you, but like one ship a month breaks down and we've got a protocol to handle the loss of propulsion or loss of steering that happens with a ship. Basically call the pilots, call the tugboats to get the ship safely to anchor. So there are five other ports in our area of responsibility. And those include the Chevron offshore terminal. So if you ever drive to, up to LAX airport and you see the ships anchored out there, that's the picture there. And they're basically pumping crude oil into the refinery at El Segundo to make jet fuel, diesel, and gasoline for the local market. Port Wainimi is ours, 100 miles to the north. San Diego is ours, 100 miles to the south. The Navy brings ammunition, weapons, missiles into the Seal Beach Naval Weapons Station over by Huntington. And also there's uh, anchorages at Catalina that are ours where the ships go out there so the passengers can go ashore and enjoy Catalina for the day. So all that is in our area responsibility, not just LA and Long Beach. We're big on partners. And I know this is a busy slide and I'll send them to Mrs. Finley and all if you ever wanna read them more, but basically, to succeed in life, what I have found, and this is one of the things I'd like to impart to you, is you need to learn how to work with federal, state, local, private, all the different kinds of uh, entities that are out there. And if you wonder why the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, is highlighted for the Little Marine Exchange, the answer is cybersecurity. And there's a wonderful program they have for companies like us to get the best information to protect us from the hackers who are constantly trying to take us down to disrupt cargo flow and also to steal our money. So in this port complex, as I mentioned, it's all about partners, but to focus in on the ones that are most important, they're the Los Angeles Pilot Station, the Long Beach Pilot Station. There you can see the Marine Exchange in the lower left, the Coast Guard, but they won't let us take a picture. And then the Port of Long Beach Joint Command Center. It's these five places that are actually working together to control the traffic. And if you haven't heard the term harbor pilot before, it's different than airplane pilots that sit up front and steer um, and fly the airplane. They go out in a little boat to get on the ship and to help the captain of the ship get his or her ship into port. One of the big problems is the ships come from all over the world and their English is often horrible. So you've got a good English speaking person who can talk to the tugboats, who can talk to us to make sure everything goes perfectly. The other thing the pilots know is exactly how deep the water is, where the current is, where the wind is affecting the ship. And the two pilot stations are on this local network that we have. They control the ships inside the breakwater and we control the ships that 25 miles out to sea. And it just works really, really well. But again, as I mentioned, if you're looking for a career uh, and in the maritime environment, it could be that you wind up on the networking end of things, keeping all these sites live 24 hours a day, not talking on a radio or not doing the scheduling function. So here's what it looks like inside one of the sites. This is at the Port of Long Beach Joint Command Center, which is our backup site. But something that's really, really cool about what we do, other than the four sites that are uh, mentioned there, is if you look in the lower right hand side of the screen to the picture where it says Christopher and whale in net. So basically one day the fishing vessel Christopher came upon this whale tangled in a net. The controller put the dotted green circle around the whale and the Christopher, pushed the button and it exported to all those other places to the sector, which is the Coast Guard LA Long Beach, 
the Los Angeles pilots, the Long Beach pilots, and the Long Beach Joint Command Center. So everybody knew that there was this poor whale stuck in a net with people trying to untangle it. And we then want the ships not to run into this. So if you see the APL Thailand coming in, that's she actually cut the corner on how you normally would enter LA. But because we've got this five site VTS, everybody knew what was going on. We could divert the ship safely around the whale. The whale was safely cut out. No collisions, no groundings. That's our measure of success. Here's another example that was very tragic, but again, it's an example of the five partners working together. So basically what happened on the 5th of February, 2016, two light planes were flying out over the ocean and had a mid air collision. And if you look at the picture on the right where it says dive boat one and the red circle, you can see there is the, uh, the dive boat that was trying to recover the, the people when they were unsuccessful, but that's basically where the two planes crashed. The problem was, you can see that's just south of the entrance to Los Angeles. And the Coast Guard captain of the port closed the entrance to Los Angeles because they didn't want the ship's propellers stirring up the water to make bubbles so the divers couldn't see. They didn't want the propellers turning up the bottom in the sand so it would perhaps fall on the debris. But because we've got this partnership with the pilots, if you look at the picture on the left, that articulated tug and barge in the yellow in that big white cruise ship that's in the yellow box came down out of Los Angeles, made a left turn inside the breakwater. So you can see the breakwater is that line of rocks um, on the right-hand side of the picture. So those two vessels inside the breakwater went out on the Long Beach side and we were able to keep the traffic moving for the five days that the diving operations were going on. And again, it's a way that we could keep commerce moving to keep the people and the food and the oil and everything else comes on the ship coming in and out of the port, even though we couldn't go in and out of Los Angeles and Long Beach. And again, it worked very, very well. So moving on to current events, and I'm two thirds of the way through this, then we'll take your questions. If you remember back a year ago, and it seems amazing, COVID first hit, and it hit, at least in my life, I think in yours, very, very unexpectedly. And what happened was in March to June, a bunch of oil tankers had been coming across the ocean, and it takes them as much as a month to get here from halfway around the world. But unfortunately, then people stopped driving, planes stopped flying. So we had all this oil coming in, but it wasn't being consumed. So this was a picture looking out the windows of the Marine Exchange when we had as many as 32 ships at anchor, including 24 tankers, all safely anchored until their product was needed ashore and they could go to a berth to offload it. So then cleared that back up in June, the oil companies slowed the ships down to meet the demand. But then what happened in the fall was everybody started buying stuff. So I don't know about in your lives, but what happened more broadly was in the summertime, everybody was hunkered down. We didn't go traveling. We didn't go on vacation and not much happened. But then in September, people started buying stuff. And it's interesting what they were buying. And I don't know how much this will relate to you, but it was home gym equipment, home office equipment, home remodeling equipment, replacing the personal protective equipment, all that kind of stuff people started ordering. And basically they were using the money they weren't using to go out to restaurants to buy a new treadmill or whatever. 19 million Hewlett Packard computers, for example, came in through this port complex by ship. And that started a backup uh, that happened in September and is still ongoing because people are still buying stuff. And so this was a picture looking out our window again, you can all see the ships lined up and the record was 60 ships at anchor, of which 40 were container ships. And put that in perspective, if you remember five years ago, there was congestion. That was 48 ships, of which 28 were container ships. So we've flown through all the prior records, but still doing it safely. So looking top down, this is what Paris or Thomas and Chi and John and their colleagues are looking at. Basically, all the circles are what are called the anchorages. So those are the parking spots. And basically, when the ship checks in with us, we already know the length because of the computer, but we ask the captain how much draft you have because as the ship comes across the ocean, it burns off fuel 
and it isn't as deep in the water. So if the captain says, I have a 50 foot draft, we have to make sure to put that ship in an anchorage that's at least 50 feet deep. So we place the ships in the circles. We then turn on the alarm. So both the computer is watching the ship and my people are watching the ship to make sure it stays in the circle and doesn't do what's called drag anchor to either bump into another ship or run aground. And this again is one of the computer systems that we use that needs maintained by good computer people. So that I took this picture yesterday, knowing that I would be briefing you. So this is what it looked at outside our windows yesterday. And you can see it looks pretty much the same. We've really reached a kind of a status quo now on how many ships are out there, roughly 50 of which roughly 30 are container ships. And to orient yourself, you can see where I drew the arrow to the entrance to LA Harbor, the LA Lighthouse, and then Gaffey Street is right outside our front windows. So I know this is a busy slide, but it also helps put things in perspective about what's going on. So if you look to the left-hand side of the slide, to the lower left-hand corner, to the orange line, you can see I go back to 1 January 2019. And that orange line in 2019, as you move to the right, kind of goes up and down between 10 and 20 ships. And that's the number of ships at anchor on any given day. That's normal. The ships are early and their berth isn't available or they've discharged their cargo and they need to clean their tanks, they're refueling, they're getting food, they're changing crew. So roughly 10 to 20 ships. And look at where we are today with roughly 50 to 60 ships at anchor. And that's the backup that we have presently because people are buying stuff but unfortunately on the goods movement side ashore, the some number of the truck drivers, the train drivers, the longshoremen have COVID or they're out because of contact tracing. So just when you have more cargo coming in, you have fewer people to move it ashore. So that's the present backup that we have at anchor is that orange line again, going from between 10 and 20 ships at anchor, you can see there between 40 and 60. Regarding the container ships, this is where it really, really is interesting. So again, if you look at the left-hand side of the slide, the line in the blue at the bottom, you can see back to 1 January 2019, the normal number of container ships at anchor is zero to one. And you can see there was a little spike to four there in September for some reason. Again, if you look at that blue line on the left-hand side of the slide along the bottom, you can see where it says 15 February, 2020. In April, it was still low. In June, it was still low. Container ships were coming and going as they should be. But then look what happened roughly the 15th of October, where it started to go up. And that's where we got as many as 57 extra container ships that shocked the system with all that stuff that people were buying. And you can see there that blue line going up past 10 ships at anchor, past 20 ships at anchor, past 30 ships at anchor. And you could see that we wound up with 40 ships at anchor container ships on the 1st of February. And there you can see it's dropped down to about 30 now and we've settled out there. The other thing that's interesting when you say, why don't they work harder? They are working harder. So if you look at the green line, again, starting on the left, you can see that between 10 and 20 container ships were at a berth on any given day between the 1st of January, 2019 and the middle of 2020, if you look at where it says the 15th of June. And then you notice it goes up, 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 and you can notice it got up to 30, a little bit more than 30, but roughly we're now in the high 20s for the number of container ships at a berth. So they used to work between 10 and 20, they're now working between 25 and 30, so they are working harder, but it still doesn't meet moving out the cargo that is being ordered by the member public from Amazon and Costco and everywhere else that people buy stuff. So it's a very interesting situation that we have now. And now three second slides that show what it looks like from the top. So this is again, one of the sensor systems that we have. And in this case, I sorted on just the container ships. And you can see the ones at the top of the slide are up in the harbor at a berth. The ones out in the water you can see are anchored. And the one in the green box are special contingency anchorages that we have down off of Huntington when we overfill the normal anchorages off of Los Angeles and Long Beach. So this is the sorting just on the tankers. 
And this is a very normal population of tankers where you can see one, two, three, four, five anchored offshore. That's very normal. They're moving uh, normally, but unfortunately, sometimes when there are too many container ships at anchor or too many of any kind of ships, we run out of anchorages. So what we do is we give them what we call a drift area. We talk to the captain, we say, hey, where do you want to drift? And literally just like your car where you might stop by the side of the road, the ship picks a spot in the ocean and says, this looks good, I'll drift here. They turn off the engine and they just drift with the wind for a couple hours. If they get too close to another ship, they get too close to land, they start the engine and move into another place to drift. But we don't have any tankers or container ships or really anybody uh, in a drift area for the past week. And then the last population that's interesting here are the passenger vessels. So if you see them coming and going, the big white ships, the big blue ships, they have no passengers aboard, but they need to be somewhere. So there are no bartenders aboard. There are no entertainment people aboard. The, the hotel staff is all off the ship, but you still have the captain and the deck watch officers driving the ship around. You still have the engineers and you need some cooks to feed them. So basically they come and go roughly once a month for food and fuel and groceries. So you can see there that the Carnival Miracle was at the dock yesterday. The Carnival Panorama was anchored. Uh, so there's, as it says, there were seven cruise ships in port yesterday. So they don't have any passengers. They're just caretaker crews until they can go cruising again with passengers. So we're very proud that we're green and we have solar panels around the building. And so if you're interested in that environmental kind of stuff, the ports are very, very interested in being good stewards of the environment. And you can see our 250 solar panels there. And it's a good picture of our building high on a hill. You can see all the radars and radio antennas on top. And as I said, if you never want to go to sea on a boat, we've got jobs for you. We're very friendly to the whales. We want to make sure that whales don't get hit by ships. So when we learn where there are whales, we radio the ships, we email their agents, those are the people on shore, and we've even got Twitter and Facebook if you want to follow us that way. So just in terms of three closing slides to summarize, as I mentioned, 8,000 TEUs used to be a big ship. Now we're up to 23. So they're huge ships and they're still getting bigger. The deep draft tankers, so you can see the ship on the right and the red part of the ship is what's underwater up to 69 feet deep. So a seven story building underwater is what those tankers are bringing in to meet the demand of the driving public and of the aircraft uh, burning jet fuel. There are narrow channels, tight schedules, and bad weather, but all the different ports uh, and port partners, the tugs, the pilots, the line handlers working together for that safe, secure, efficient, reliable, and environmentally sound vessel movement system. So the picture on the left is sent to me by one of my people on a busy morning. So there you can see, as I mentioned, rush hour. So you can see the name of each ship. The vector out ahead of it shows where they're going to be in 15 minutes. So the controller is making sure that no vectors touch each other, which would indicate a collision. You can see the circles of the ships at anchor, and that's a normal number of ships at anchor. Notice all of the empty circles. That's that 17 ships at anchor, uh, which is very normal. And as I mentioned yesterday, we had 40. I'm a math kind of person, so I kind of like equations. So I thought this would make kind of fun for you. So I created an equation that says modern equipment plus great marine exchange and Coast Guard people equals a strong marine exchange and vessel traffic service. So there you can see Debbie, she's our maritime information manager, came out of the banking industry actually, great expertise. The teamwork that I mentioned before, you've got Chief Robert, our senior Coast Guard member working with Mike Martin. And in the lower right-hand side, we've got Mike Connor, one of the vessel traffic controllers. So teamwork, vigilance, and expertise are three of our hallmarks. And this is just kind of a pretty picture to close. If you do want to work in the maritime industry, you do need to be ready to work nights and weekends. We never stop, just like airplanes never stop. So this was a picture that one of my people sent me of sunrise over the porch. You can see the cranes sticking up. So with that, I'll unshare my screen and happy to take your questions and comments and have a discussion. Great, thank you so much, Captain Kip. So we have lots of great questions. Thank you so much to everybody who chimed in in the chat. If you think of something else, 
feel free to jump in on that. I'm going to go first to Eva's question. And you touched on it a little bit, but maybe if you could reiterate a little more with regards to in what ways has tracking ships changed during COVID? The tracking part actually did not change. The big thing that happened in 1940 was we got radar. So we could see the ships out in the ocean as far as the radar will go. And as I mentioned, it'll pick up a big steel ship much further away than it will pick up a plastic speedboat. Then the other thing that came up 15 years ago was that AIS. So now every ship in the world is pinging, here I am, here I am. So you can get that vision of ships, you know, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, we know we can click on it and get exactly what it is, where it's going, how fast it's going. So a COVID world did not change the tracking piece at all, but what it did do was fill the anchorages. And so the question is, what do you then do with the ships? And the answer is that drift area issue. And it's not as simple as it would look because we don't want the ships drifting in the traffic lanes. We don't want them drifting too close to shore and to run aground. So it's placing them carefully when we need to have them drift, but the tracking piece actually did not change. Fantastic, great. Thank you so much, appreciate that. Yeah, we've been talking about that a lot on our team. For some of us to purchase exercise equipment, the shipping times have been crazy, uh, but it's good to know that everybody's hard at work out there. So next question, I'm just trying to answer these in order. Emily Perez wants to know, what inspired you to pursue this career? Uh, my dad was in the Navy during World War II, and he went to sea in three different ships. And he kind of said to me back in New York, which is where I grew up, go do something fun if you can for a couple years out of college rather than just wind up in a desk job living for the weekends. And oh, by the way, you're really good at this water thing, even though I did get seasick for 20 years. But it was a merger of that go do something different and I loved the water. We could see the East River in New York where I grew up from our apartment. And so I kind of got the hook to say, hey, this would be fun. And joining the Coast Guard was my way to do that. My son, to digress, is doing it a different way. His answer to COVID was to literally run away to sea. He went to get his Coast Guard papers as a deckhand. Now, there's a school you go to for a week. And then he's just finished his requirements to be a captain. And so he's on a 127 foot vessel as a crew member, because he said, I don't want to go to college on a Zoom screen. I can do that later. Uh, so he'll go to sea uh, somehow, some way, but there are different ways to do it. But basically dad imprinted, go do something fun. I would imprint that to you. And second is, I love the water. Great. Great, thank you. Yeah, that's a, a great segue into our next question. Uh, Pilar Reynoso would like to know, what is your favorite or most fun part of the job for you? It's a perfect, great question. It's a perfect job for someone like me because it's actually got three pieces that fit my personality. One is to run the 20 person company. So every Friday I sign checks for accounts payable. We do our payroll, we do health care, we do our retirement plan, all that stuff. Where are we going to get our COVID shots and all that kind of stuff? Run the company inside the building. The second piece is the operational piece. So it's controlling all those ships out there and making decisions on where we're going to put them and to work with the watchstanders. I don't stand watch at three o'clock in the morning, but I need to make sure that the people working at three in the morning and the people working at three in the afternoon are synchronized in terms of the processes they use. And third, and without exaggeration, is being able to participate in programs such as this with the local community, because we honestly need you to want to be in this profession so we can continue it to grow. Other parts of the profession, for example, are what's called the Harbor Safety Committee. So everybody to do with safety in the ports gets together once a month used to be in person. Now it's a Zoom call to discuss safety issues. The other big group is what's called the Area Maritime Security Committee. And we joke that that committee, it's on one of the few people in the room without a gun. 
but name a police department and customs all getting together to make sure that that cargo is brought in safely, that people don't abscond from the ships, you know, run away. And um, so it's the piece with the operational piece, the inside the building piece, and then the partnerships piece is what makes it perfect for me. Fantastic. Thank you. Lizbeth Vega would like to know, was this the career that you saw yourself pursuing when you were in high school? The Coast Guard piece was, yes. I uh, Basically, there were three routes that you can go. One is the Navy, one is the Coast Guard, and one is the Merchant Marine. So that would be going to a place like Cal Maritime, or in my case in New York, there's New York Maritime, and there's also the Federal School at Kings Point. So do I want to be in the Navy? Do I want to be in the Coast Guard? Or do I want to be on a merchant ship? And I just kind of thought the mission of the Coast Guard, which is highlighted by search and rescue, it is really fun, just like the fire department putting out the fire in somebody's house to rescue them from the water when their boat sunk. And I thought that would be a good thing to do. Again, I was only thinking of doing it for five years. What dad said is, you know, don't just wind up in a downtown Manhattan office living for the weekends. The Coast Guard with that search and rescue mission uh, was perfect for me. Fantastic. Great. We are getting close to time. So I want to just try to be strategic. So I'm going to kind of jump around with questions. If we don't get a chance to get to your question, feel free. I'm sure Captain Gibb would be happy to answer via email if you want to include that in the chat or your LinkedIn, either way. Emily Perez would like to know, what would you recommend students who are interested in this field to do to get a head start in this career? As I mentioned, the three biggies of just punctuality phone skills and good computer skills really, I think, transcend almost everything that you would do today in any business. The second thing would be to start to learn that language of the sea. So just like there's English, French, and Spanish, it's, you know, find a book or go to Google to say, you know, what is bunkering? What's a container ship? A good way to start actually with young people is you become one of those agents who when the ship comes in, remember they may have never been here before and they may not speak English, but they need fuel, they need groceries, they need a pilot. And it's the people who gather all those services together, meet the ship, but then, you know, just, you know, watch what's happening. There's all the longshore kind of jobs, but every one of these terminals has people both on the admin side and the operational side, but the basics and a lot of what EXP in terms of writing a good resume, uh, being trustworthy. Some of the companies, for example, Catalina Express that runs the ferries, no tattoos. So there's some little trip wires that you can run, but it's the basics of what EXP teaches is really the foundation of both maritime industry and you know more broadly. Now, if you want to go drive a tugboat, and again, I, I'm not knocking that. That's the place I wanted to be. Cal Maritime can be a place to go. Or there are schools like my son went to, the closest one is San Diego, where you can get the boutique classes that you need of, to get your deckhand license, first aid and CPR and firefighting and all that kind of stuff. Then you can go to those shorter schools, as I said, the closest one is San Diego. Great. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. And who wouldn't want to go to San Diego, huh? Beautiful <laughs> beaches. Uh, all kinds of good stuff, especially if you love the water. Okay, uh, so what internship opportunities exist for students with your company? That's a great question. So we've had an intern every summer for many, many years. Until last year, it's always been in person. And we basically divide the person's time between that maritime information service, the vessel traffic service, and then we didn't touch on it much, but there's accounting and HR. So those are the three big places. And usually we'd save up projects for the intern to do. And one of the ones that we do every summer is our business resumption drill. So if we lost this building, if you picture that slide with the five sites, if this one went down, where do we go and who picks up the load? And last year, that's what we actually did. We had four virtual interns and they planned that drill, came up with the scenario, came up with the drill plan, and even in a virtual setup. So that's one of the things that we always do, aside from having the intern work in our three different departments. Um, we're going to do it again this summer. I've understood it's in a virtual world, and uh, maybe some of you will be part of it. So. Yeah, I just want to make that distinction. These are EXP intern positions as far as right. that goes. Is that correct, Captain? Correct. 
Yeah. So if you're currently enrolled in the internship program or planning to be in the future, Captain Kipps, one of our longstanding employers who is so gracious to have some work sites for us. So great opportunities there. Um, I, I, thinking this is an EXP and Mrs. Finley, we have yeah. other interns through time. And basically, uh, we, we've had college students coming home for the holidays that said, hey, I got two weeks off and nothing to do. We even uh, had a college student uh, who spent a week on the roof where basically all the tags on our antennas had come off. We kind of lost track of what antenna was what. And I remember Amelia Sween spent a week on the roof figuring out what went to what. And it was a perfect job for an intern. We had another intern where we needed to update a book called The Coast Pilot. We kind of save up these projects and then someone pops up and said, hey. And it was basically to go through this book and find out everything that had been changed. And then he wrote three letters, one to the Coast Guard, one to NOAA, and one to the Harbor Safety Committee, basically dividing up to say, this is your problem, this is your problem, this is your problem to fix. So EXP is kind of the focus because I was on this call, but it is more broad, it is limited. So if you call, that doesn't mean we'll necessarily have everything or something at the time you want, but we might. Okay, I think that's a perfect note to end on. Internships are great. The Marine Exchange offers lots of them in EXP and even for college students too as well. Uh, some great opportunities. So I'm going to go ahead and end it there. I want to thank everybody for coming out. We had a great turnout today. I think we had about 35 people on the call. We're doing it again tomorrow twice. Thank you again to Captain Kip for coming out. Thank you again uh, to Ms. Finley for bringing your students out. We truly appreciate it. We love these opportunities to connect industry leaders such as the captain to the classroom and hone in on those uh, those strong ties that we've had with ITA all these years So and, and Bandy High School. So thank you so much to everybody. Thank you for everybody uh, who asked questions in the chat. Anything else you want to say, uh, Captain, before we sign off? Thank you so much for the opportunity, Mrs. Finley. It's been wonderful working with you and the other teachers uh, through the years. And to the students, I would just say, don't hesitate to reach out and say, hey, if you ever get something, can you keep my name uh, on file? I'd be happy, you know, Gabriel or whatever, send the, my email around. The other thing you might want to do is check us out on our website, www.mxsocal.org. There's two videos there that tell more about what we do. Be yourself and really go for it because you honestly are the future of America. And people like me at the other end of my career want people like you to be coming up to replace people like me. So again, thank you so much. You're absolutely wonderful. And I look forward to when we can see each other in person again. Hi, Mrs. Finley. Hello. Thank you, Captain. We definitely miss everyone. I really enjoy when we have our earning the rights, the passion that you have for our students and everything you have to offer. And thank you for always being supportive and sharing your knowledge and the words of wisdom and encouragement that you give our students. We really appreciate everything that you do for us and congratulations on your success as well. Okay. Thanks everybody. We will see you soon. Take care. Bye.